Cool. Hey, um, today's message is just is going to lead to communion. Um, and today I just really wanted to design this message to make us think. So I'm just going to read from these cool Bibles. Isn't it amazing, these Bibles that come with the church? 1 Corinthians 1.18 for the, word of the, of the, uh, for the word of the cross is to them that are perishing foolish, but unto us which are being saved, it is the power of God. Romans 1, 16. For uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believe it, to the, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, today we're called the power at the cross. This is what we want to talk about, the power that is at the cross. But my question to you, church, and I just want you to think, I just want you to, to walk with me this journey today. It's not so message as, as so much as I'm trying to, um, yeah, I'm not trying to preach a message. I'm just trying to get you to open up and, and to think today on Easter Sunday. So what makes a person powerful? If I was to ask you, if we were to sit down, what does a powerful person look like? And then how does one go about becoming powerful? Is power to do with influence? Because many people that have a lot of influence seem like they're powerful. Has it to do with money? Because often the ones with the money call the shots, and it seems like they have the power. Is the money to do? Uh, is power to do with strength? And is the strongest person the most powerful, or is it a combination of all three? There's a saying that says, uh, "Power tends to corrupt." And absolute power corrupts absolutely. So my next question is, can there be good power? Is there a thing as too much power? There are those that crave power and will do anything to obtain this. But instead, in truth, when you want to uh, obtain power, all you're saying is, I want to control. True power is often found in restraint. I'm going to give you an example of that. I play football, Masters football. One of the guys I played with, he was a Golden Gloves boxing champion. He is a very, very fit, sharp old man like me. But boy, I tell you what, in his day, he was a very, very good boxer. Often in Masters, guys get a bit pushy and shovy. Sometimes it can get a bit heated. Not me. I'm a Christian. The one with the most power is not the one who starts the fight. The one with the most power is not the one who makes the most noise. I believe that the one with the most power is the one knowing he could take them all down if he wanted to, smiles and walks away. I've never seen this guy, Ryan knows him, I've never seen him square up to anyone, I've never seen him um, threaten, but I've often seen him de-escalate things. I remember one, it was a Saturday night and some of the boys had been out and so they come back and, and one of the boys said, hey, the team we're playing tomorrow, I don't like these guys, why don't we start something? I know, we're men, we're not that mature. But why don't we start something? And he turned around to my, my friend, who he knew was a Golden Gloves boxing champion, and he said, if I start something, have you got my back? And he said, no. If you start it, you finish it. See, sometimes we attribute power, we put it places where it shouldn't be. I think that's power, a guy that knowing that he was probably one of the strongest guys in the Masters tournament chose not to use that power. He chose to use a thing called restraint because he would not use what he has to dominate or abuse others. And when other people were even trying to encourage him to do that, he still stood back and said, no, that is not me. I will not use what I've tra been trained to do. I will not use that power to oppress or hurt others. See, true power is often only found in restraint. You cannot control anyone's actions, but you can control 
your reaction. You cannot control anyone's reaction, but you can choose to control how you react. And I believe that's a sign of true power. In other words, the power of restraint is also the power of self-control. 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God will never give you the spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. In the Word of God, in the Bible, power, love, and self-control go together. So many Christians want to see the power of God move. They want to see the power to see miracles and healings. They want God to fix this problem, smite that, fix the government. They want God to use his power, but they themselves in their own life don't have the power of self-control. That was just a side note. I found to put that in there. The biggest display of power the world has ever seen, the biggest display of power that that has ever been seen was at the cross. It wasn't during one of the world wars. It wasn't when we had a country that is a superpower and they could dominate other countries. There's never been a ruler or a king or a person in history. There's never been an example like the power that was shown on the day that Jesus was crucified on the cross. It's been the, most, it's been the biggest display on power the world has ever, ever seen was on the day someone died on a cross. I was put in a situation recently when I had to defend one of my children and due to the potential consequences and what I believe was unfair of the charges I as dad acted like a big bear I asked Jacinda if what I was doing was okay, and she stood with me and she said, yes, you need to defend your child. So I did. I decided to fight for my child. And I realized I, if that meant I ended up burning some bridges or upsetting some other people along the way, I was going to be happy with that. It caused me to lose some sleep, and it caused me to be bold in an opinion, opinionated way. Some may even say stubborn. I don't normally like doing this. You know, if one of the children comes home, go to trouble at school, what did you do? Do, You know, trouble at school, what did you do? All right, make it right. But in this situation, I felt I needed to defend. I learned something about myself, and that is my loyalty takes second place when I believe there's been injustice. (laughs) And I realize I have to watch this. Often there's a right and wrong, black and right, when it comes to justice in my eyes. I felt for my child, and I was pleased I was there when they needed me, because I had the power to do something for them. I had the power to do something for my child. As a father, I had the power to defend my child and it was that that broke my heart this week because we look at Jesus dying on the cross and we feel the injustice the pain the suffering but just for a moment I looked through God's eyes because he had the power God had the power to stop was what was happening to Jesus he could have done a number of things when he saw his son being treated wrong when Jesus asked God to take the burden from him, when Jesus was praying and saying, God, if it's your will, take this burden from me. Do you know what? God had the power to take that burden from him. When Jesus was betrayed with a kiss, God had the power to stop what was about to happen. When Jesus was mocked, when he was insulted, When he was beaten, God had the power to stop it. When they were accusing his son and lying about him and the hate towards his own son, he had the power to stop that too. 
when the sentence come down and said he will be sentenced to death, Jesus was going to be sentenced to death. death. God had the power to stop him. When they stripped him and they whipped him, God had the power to stop it. When they drove thorns into his head, God had the power to stop it. When they forced him to carry the thing that they would, would ultimately take his life, the cross, God had the power to stop it. When they put him on the cross and nails were put through his hands and nails were put through his feet, God was not helpless. God had the power to stop it. When they hoisted the cross into the air, God had the power to stop that too. When Jesus asked God to forgive the others that are hurting him because they don't know what they were doing, imagine your father's heart. When people are hurting your son and your son goes, forgive those people, God had the power to stop the people hurting his son. When Jesus cried out, When he cried out to his father, why have you forsaken me? This is the one that got me. Dad, help. Dad, I need you. Dad, are you there? Dad. See, I could see God turning his face, but he could not close his ears. Dad, why have you left me? Dad, why did you desert me? God had the power to stop it. So you'll never truly understand true power until you know the power that comes from restraint. And on the day that Jesus died on the cross was the biggest display of power the world has ever seen. There's been nothing before and nothing since that can show us true power. Sorry. Matthew 27, 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Sonia, can I get you up on keys, please? The power of the cross is the fact that God chose you over his son. Do you understand that? Do you realize that God chose restraint? God had the power to change, but he chose restraint. He chose to not to use that power that for you 2,000 years later that you would have a relationship with him. He chose not to use the power. He chose to be restrained at any time when Jesus cried out, can you take this from me? Why have you forsaken me? He chose to restrain from using that power. So now, 2,000 years later, you can have that relationship with father and son where you are God's son and you can daughter, you can come into that place. He had to make a choice. And there's never, ever been an act of power like that in the world. And there'll never be another act of power like that ever again in this world where a father chose to use restraint. But he chose it for you. He chose it for you. He chose it for me. God turned his back on his own son. But when I'm saying that, he just turned his face but he could still hear, even though he had the power to help him. Jesus even said this early on, don't you realize that I could ask my heavenly father for angels to come at any time to deliver me? And instantly he would answer me by sending more than 12 legions of angels. He'd send 72,000 angels to come and protect us 
but that would thwart the prophetic, uh, prophetic plan of God, what had been written that it would happen this way. God knew what was going to happen to Jesus. It wasn't a surprise. But in his power, almighty power, he chose restraint. We're going to go into a time of communion now. Communion is a time for us to reflect. But I'm just going to ask you that as we go through communion, that we're just going to reflect on one thing. And that is this. When God witnessed his son being tortured and whipped and beaten and nailed to a cross, when he heard the strike of the hammer on the nails that pierced through the flesh that held him to the cross, when God knew he had the power it says he turned his face, but he couldn't close his ears. And when Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? Do you know who God was looking at at that time? The only thing that got God through was he was looking at you. The only thing that made it possible for God to turn his face away from his son being tortured on the cross, that he was looking at you and saying, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this for you. You can't get through something like that unless there's something else. And that something else was you. So we're not taking communion out of religion today. We're taking it out. And when are you come for communion? I just want you to picture that. God could listen and hear what was going on. But God is looking at you in the eyes and said, look, this is what I did. I had the power to stop it but I chose the power of restraint so you could come and be in relationship with me. And that's a simple message today. So I'd like to invite you forward, if you want to, come and take communion with us. But as you're taking communion, it's not a time to talk. It's a time to look into those eyes of God and to say thank you. Thank you for your restraint. Thank you for looking for me, for searching for me, so I can have relationship with you. So please, when you're ready, come forward and join me now in a time of communion. One of the things that was placed upon Jesus when he was on the cross. So you know there was a crown of thorns and the scarlet robe. and One of the things that was placed upon Jesus was, was my sin. And that was the reason God couldn't look at his own son. Because he bore the sin of the world. But he could look at the promise that as Jesus took the sin, he could look at the promise, at the fulfillment, and that was you and me. And that's what he chose to do in that instant. And that's what God chose to do, was to look at the promise, to look at the promise, to look at the promise, to look at you, that you are now sin-free. Because Jesus took it. You are the promise that God was desiring. You are the relationship he wanted to connect with. You are the children that were lost that he searched for. If that doesn't make a picture, a father would, that would do anything for you. And I just 
when I, when I write my message, sometimes I, I start to write them as one in my head. And then I write it on words. And when I wrote it out, I, even, I was just, I didn't know. Was it the right message? Was I using too much emotion? Well, I knew, I knew it was going to hit me. You know what I mean? When I was preaching it, because when I went through it, it hit me. And I'm like, ah, how do I, you know? And I was questioning. And this is, but as I was having communion, do you know who come to me and sat with me? Yeah, that was actually Father God. And he just told me, you know, he just, he just took me through it. And you know what? That's God. And he's sitting not just with me, he's sitting with all of you today. And do you know what he's saying? He's saying, you were worth it. He's saying, you're worth it, Hannah. You were worth it. And she said that about you before you were born, that you were worth it. He just loves you. He just loves you. Can we just stand and I'll close in prayer, please? Father God, here we are in Omaru. We're a small church in a small town and in a small country. But Father God, from this, this place, we just want to say that we love you. We want to thank you. And we just say, Father God, we just want to have a relationship with you. No more religion, but relationship. Father God, we, I wouldn't choose me, but you chose me. I don't deserve it, but you said I deserve it, so I thank you for that. Father God, here we are in Amaru, and we just say we love you. We worship you today. You are our God. You are our Father. Your Son is our King. Your Son is our brother. And we just worship you today, Father God. Because all praise and glory and honor belongs to you. Amen. Amen.